I knew in the back of my mind that I was making a mistake, but I just kind of, you know, like I was just kind of pushed along into it. I mean, generally, they speaking. told me that the only reason I was not joining was my reactive mind, which was controlling me and telling me not to do it because your reactive mind stops you from doing good things, and this was a good thing, and I couldn't confront and take the responsibility to do it because of my reactive mind. So I should be bigger than my reactive mind and go and do it. So, so then I was like, oh yeah, I don't want my reactive mind to control me, so I better do it. Mm -hmm. They use virtually any tactic from yelling to, they'll show you like newspaper clippings of horrible things that have happened in the news and say like, we try to stop this and ever since we've been working on this area, you know, the crime has gone down and we've helped all these families and you think, oh God, you know, I'd be such a horrible person if I didn't go in here and help them out in this and I would just be irresponsible and not doing my duty towards all of mankind. That's exactly That sort is. of thing. And um, they also show you this policy that Eleanor Hubbard wrote saying, and it was written in 1970, and it said in 30 years the planet won't support human life. And then they told us the only reason it still is supporting human life, because this was in, I don't know, 93, so we had seven years to go, but the only reason it's made any improvement is because of Scientology, and if we don't keep going, the planet isn't even going to be able to support life. So you have half of me going like, I can't let my reactive mind control me, and half of me going, I have to help mankind. And then part of me was going, oh wow, I'm going to get paid money, and I don't have to wear a uniform, and it's going to be so fun, and these you know, guys are going to, I'm going to work with them. They said I get to work with them. So the next day I started, and I started what's called the Estates Project Force, which is boot camp. And um, my schedule was something like get up at 6.30, breakfast at 7, 7.30 we had like a muster, like a staff meeting thing, and we had to, you know, drill and do military marching and stuff. And then... Um, then I had to run around and empty trash cans till 8 o'clock, and then I had to study Scientology material for five hours straight, just like what your attitude should be like about ethics, about uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, then the rest of the day was work. Worse. We'd have half an hour for dinner, the rest of the day was work, and um, I had to clean pots and pans, mop floors, clean out a, a broken, clogged toilet. What about school? No school. What do you mean? No school. You're 14 years old. Yeah, but you don't. They they don't send. They sent me to school afterwards. Not very much anyway. But I'll get into that. But um, no school while you're in the states project force. Just the five hours of Scientology study. Um, some people were on for months. I was on for two weeks because I was able to study the uh, courses quickly. Um, but for those two weeks, the rest of the time I was working, and then we do drilling, more drilling, more marching. Drilling of like um, they'd have like the code of a Sea Org member and we'd have to repeat it and learn it so we knew it verbatim. Mm -hmm. We'd have to march, we'd have to salute, things like that. Um, so that went on for two weeks. I finished. I went to start working at Bridge Publications. The day I started working there, they told me, you're being temporarily transferred. And I, <laughs> said, no. I was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, you have to. You have no choice because you have no staff status. You have to complete some courses before you have any rights as a staff member which even when you complete the courses, they can still transfer you. Of course, the people that are telling you this aren't the same people that recruited you. No, no. But you they said, it's just temporary, it's two months, you'll be right back here. So I agreed to it. I said, okay, I can take it for two months. Then I had to wear a uniform, and I went to work as the, uh, the International Justice Chief's Administrator. I was like their secretary. So the International Justice Chief is the one who is responsible for declaring people suppressive persons, which means you know no one in Scientology can speak to them anymore if they've done something wrong. Doing committees of evidence, which is Scientology's way of like, it's like the court system in Scientology, uh, et cetera. So I was in charge of writing letters and putting all this stuff together and things like that. And I did that for a couple months. And then while I was working there, they said, you're being permanently transferred to the International Training Organization. Now I knew, see, each organization is separate, but it's all part of the C organization, so it's all one, but each one's separate, and they um, have to make their own money and support their own staff. So I knew this organization particularly, they weren't making any money. The staff were eating refried beans and rice every day. That's a thing in the C If you're in trouble or you're not like making money, you, you eat refried beans and rice every day, and water, and that's they all you get. They won't give you anything else? It's called the rice and beans. Thing. So they were on that meal every day, and the staff were getting paid $15 a week, I think it was. They were on like 
half pay or quarter pay. This is at pay. the International Training Org? Yeah. So I said, there's no way I'm going to work there. I've done nothing wrong. And all of a sudden, I'm going to be paid nothing and have to eat beans and rice. So they said, you have no staff status. You have no choice. My mom, it's funny, actually, because I thought I was going to be able to work with my mom or, or close to her. And where was she working? Well, she was working in that building that I got transferred to. Uh, but as soon as I joined, she got sent away on what they call a mission to go and handle an organization in Mexico. So she was down there the whole time. So I tried to call her to get her to help me, but I could never get through to her. And she wouldn't have been able to help me anyway because it's, you know, out of her jurisdiction. So I was refusing and refusing, and they said, you have no choice. And I was going to get into big trouble, so I had to agree and go along with it. And what would big trouble have meant? It would have meant lower conditions. What does that mean? Yeah, uh, you get like penalized, you have to do amends, do work on your own time to make up for what you've done. You have to get everyone's permission to come back into the group. You have to, um, you know, do like soul searching and find out like what you've done wrong and what kind of person you really should be. And um, it's horrible. It's like uh, you get this like label put on you. Like, you're a bad person until you handle this. Uh -huh. And people know. And you can get other penalties. You can't get any time off. Your meal breaks get shortened. Um, you can have some of your pay taken away, things like that. You, you, all, like, all your privileges, what little you have, are gone. So, um, so no one likes that. Yeah. So, I can imagine. So I agreed, and I had no choice. And I, and I became the receptionist. And I was the receptionist for about six months. And... Um, during this time, I started um, having a, relation a relationship with uh, a man there named Jason Merrill, and he was seven years older than me. But you're not allowed to do anything. They have a policy. You're not allowed to do anything other than kiss before you get married. If you do anything else, you're in really, really big trouble. Like.